Hi guys, welcome back and welcome to the Rugby Psychology Series. This is a video series I've been wanting to do for ages. It's been a bit busy with the Six Nations and things, but there's a bit of a gap now before the summer tours to get into this. Let me know what you think about psychology, all your experiences and opinions, because psychology isn't an exact science and of course there's plenty of opinion in this as well so i'd love to know your thoughts and your experiences from yourself and what you've observed it'll be great to get involved in some discussion if you feel like subscribing please do and many of my subscribers comment and say what they really like is the fact that they can have a proper discussion in the comments without any abuse just proper rugby fans getting into it so do get stuck in now from my point of view, the theory I'm going to use is roughly up to an A-level theory. Now, I've studied sports psychology. I teach it a bit as well. Obviously, there's a lot of personal experience there as well from you know playing, coaching, watching YouTubing, if you like. So I've got a bit of background knowledge here. I'm not saying I'm an expert, but certainly plenty of it's going to be opinion as well. So feel free to disagree and get stuck into those comments because that's going to be really interesting. So the title of this video... Is sports psychology a load of rubbish? Is psychology in rugby a load of rubbish? Now, clearly I don't think so, or I wouldn't be making a video series about it, but it's a commonly held view, and actually one that's got a number of valid reasons why someone might think this, actually. And it's fairly natural to think psychology, to some degree, is rubbish or not as relevant as you may think. Now, this point of view is probably more prevalent in players. Players, by definition, are younger, unless you're lucky and all your joints work and you're still playing veterans rugby, all power to you, but generally younger and they're less mature. They've got less world experience. They haven't experienced psychology's impact on you know, their lives as much, if you like, or reflected on it. In rugby culture, as we know, in you know male rugby culture, we might call it a macho world where you might not discuss your feelings as much. I think it's better in the female rugby culture, but still not something that's discussed enough. So you may naturally think it's rubbish because you don't discuss it. And of course, you may well have actually learnt the psychological traits you need to be successful in rugby without even thinking about it. So you think it's not relevant because you've actually done it already and it is relevant, but you just have done it subconsciously. So there's a number of reasons why you may have that view. Now, another reason why some players are very resistant to sports psychology, they may think it's a load of rubbish, is they're trying to protect their self-esteem. They may actually have gaping holes in their psychology that's really holding them back. And if they were to change and improve, they could make huge jumps. I reckon a lot of techniques, say in the tackle, in attack, just general confidence can be solved or certainly improved massively through changes in psychology but players may be very resistant against it. Even when confronted with obvious flaws, with you know, video evidence, etc., players may dismiss it as psychological rubbish, something they don't need. They may push against it, saying it's other people's fault or they're being picked on. So I think that sort of player is a very interesting one and very hard to reach, actually. So let's get into self-esteem. There's lots of definitions. I've got some up there, but it's pretty much how much you like yourself, how much you value yourself. And high self-esteem is incredibly useful in sports like rugby. You know, it's heavily linked to things like confidence, arousal, motivation, helps you be a good leader. So having high self-esteem is a real must-have, if you like. And you can chop it up into a number of pieces. So you could have academic. Now, academic self-esteem in rugby isesn't quite as relevant, although line-out gurus may disagree, of course. And it's one reason why sport is such a great way of building self-esteem if you don't have a high perception of your academic ability. And that word's important, perception. It may not be reality. If you perceive to be high in these areas, then you will have a high self-esteem, even if maybe objectively you aren't so much. Now, a player may build their whole self-esteem around their physical factors, their strength, their speed, their skill, and they ignore those other two, the social, the emotional, that actually has a big makeup in their self-esteem, and they may have a gaping holes in there as well that they just don't want to address or they're not particularly aware of. So let's take a hypothetical example of a fly half. We won't use any names, but we probably know a few examples. Uh, someone who's got a pathetic commitment to tackles, let's say. You know, they really don't commit. They just do the swing door tackles or grab with the arms, or they just don't like falling over, to be honest. And they blame other people. They act arrogant, for example. They alienate their teammates. So there's some glaring holes in their psychology. Now, even though the coach is kind of obviously telling them the truth, 
They resist it. They don't want to feel uncomfortable. They don't want to challenge their self-esteem because who wants to feel bad about themselves? And you don't want to naturally feel this cognitive dissonance where everything doesn't line up. If they were to accept the truth, it means there's all of a sudden a gaping hole in the self-esteem they thought they had. And who wants to feel like that? So that resistance is you know, kind of expected. But the question is, how do you break through it? And that's a really hard one. Now, a lot of coaches will know how hard this is, especially at a lower level. You may not want to upset a younger player, especially, say, under 18s, or annoy them because, you know, amateur coaches want to retain players. You need players. You don't want your most talented players going to another team, especially, you know, when they're not paid under contract, etc. So for reasons like this, coaches could completely ignore the problem or they could focus on the physical side. And that's very common saying, oh, you're not great at tackling let's go and work on your technique when really they know how to tackle they've been playing rugby for a long time and the problem is their psychology and they just can't admit it or the coach won't bring it up or a bit of both now a player's much more likely to accept a self-esteem challenge to that physical element so i would say don't be tempted to always focus on the physical if there's an obvious gap in the psychology now what i want you guys to do is make suggestions below as to how you could break through that barrier. Is it something the player just has to overcome themselves and at some point make that change in their mind and say, yes, I do need to change this. I know they've been right all along and you change it. And also, how do you cushion that blow to a player where they're going to have to take a bit of a hit in their self-esteem, build up those areas of emotional control, if you like, and then put it all back together again without falling apart or throwing their toys out of the pram or moving to Australia or whatever it is. Now, it's much easier to recognise huge impacts that psychology has on rugby once your own self-esteem isn't in the firing line, say you've retired or whatever it is, or you know, you're commenting on someone else, of course, it's always easier talking about someone else. Now, going back to the original question, I clearly think psychology is incredibly important and makes huge impacts in playing, and we can see the evidence all around us. Certainly in all my videos, we talk about psychology a lot when we analyse games. I mean, just think of the elements of psychology of catching a high ball under pressure. You know, some players aren't even brave enough to go for a high ball, for example. Or the high arousal levels you need to get at to play optimally in such a physical game. Or the confidence you need to go to every tackle or hit every ruck 100%. Or the cool head you might need to make the right passing option when a flanker's you know, bearing down and you're going to cut you in two. So in this series, we're going to explore some of the key psychological factors that have an impact on rugby. Hopefully you're going to find it interesting and maybe even translate it into your coaching or playing or just general interest. In the meantime, let me know of good examples that you've come across of psychology when it's worked, when it hasn't, if you think it's rubbish, if you think it's really important and anything in between. Anyway, guys, do subscribe if you're into this stuff. And of course, I'm going to be carrying on with my normal content as well. So until next time, I will catch you later.